Howdy, Central. We are in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 today, if you want to go ahead and find that in your copy of Scripture. So years ago, I was, I was flying a couple of airplanes for a, a rich guy, and he based his airplanes out of a small regional airport instead of the big airport. And I decided I would try to earn a little extra money by giving some flight instruction on the side. And so I had some cards printed up, and I had some flyers printed up, and I started posting. I went to the manager of the airport and said, is it okay if I do this? He said, of course. And so I had some, uh, I put these flyers around the airport, and I came in the next day, and they were all in the trash. So I put them back up and found them later that day in the trash. And I said, okay, who's throwing my flyers in the trash? And they told me who it was. It was a guy that I knew. I didn't know him well. And they said, and he's in the, the boss man's office right now if you want to go in there. And I said, well, I do. And I went in and I, I just said, yeah, what's up? And this guy asked me if I would like to step outside. And he started cussing me up one side and down the other. This is my airport. This is my territory. You will not take students from me. And I said, well, dial it back, man. You know, I, I'm not the step outside kind of guy. And it, no, he's bigger than me. And so we de-escalated the situation a little bit. And, you know, I'm not going to cause that. I don't think it's worth fighting over. And I didn't see that guy. That was during the week one day, and I didn't see him at the airport for the next few days. The next time I saw him was Sunday at church. That was the Sunday that Terry and I decided we would join First Baptist Church of Odessa, and we went forward to join, and they did it much like we do. We were standing down there as the church members came by and greeted us, and I looked, and here he's coming in the line. By the time he got to me, he was crying like a baby. And he was so grieved at his behavior. Because, let's face it, we've probably all had our knucklehead moments, haven't we? But it leads me to ask this question. Does what we do here matter? I mean, what we do here today, does it really matter? Do we just, do we just put on our Christian face and attitude on Sunday, and it doesn't affect anything else that we do the rest of the week? Or is there, is there something important about these times that we actually gather together here today? I mean, why are we here? Why are you here? I'm sure if we were to go around the room and just ask everybody, why are you here? Why are you here? We'd probably get the same two or three answers. I'm here for the fellowship. I'm here to worship God. But I wonder if we really, if we really plunged into the depths of our hearts, what kind of answers we might find about why each of us is actually here today. Have you stopped to give much thought about why you show up on a Sunday morning? I wonder how much of what we do as Christians is more habit than it is passion. Does our time together really matter? Does it make a, does it make a difference? Well, Solomon as John mentioned in his prayer, the wisest man we see in Scripture, he actually had something to say about corporate worship. But he wasn't talking about the what. You see, when we talk about worship, we typically focus on the what. What are we doing? What songs are we singing? What kind of prayer? What kind of instruments? What are we going to wear? What is the pastor talking about? We focus on the what, but Solomon actually peels back the layers here. And he's not talking as much about the what as he is about the how. And by the, by the way, when I say how, I'm not talking about the how up here. I'm talking about the how in here and the why. Can I just tell you, this is the, the warning label on this sermon. This sermon was incredibly convicting to me this week. So if, if you feel like you're under conviction, welcome to my world. Let's take a look at what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 5, first seven verses. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they're doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness, 
and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. Now, the first thing I need to do is address the idea of the house of God, because I think there's a lot of misconception about the house of God. In Solomon's day, clearly, what's he talking about when he talks about the house of God? He's talking about the temple. There was this place that was built before Solomon built the temple. There was a tabernacle. This was where the Spirit of God rested in a visible way. This was the representation of the manifold presence of God. God was not limited, as Scripture says, to any house or building made by human hands. God is always at all times, but he showed up in a special way there. And when Solomon built the temple, that is where the only place sacrifices could be made. That is where the worship took place. The three major feasts of the year, people made pilgrimages to, to Jerusalem to come to the house of God. And we don't have that same concept today. We do not have a temple today. And I want to be very clear on this. A church building is not the house of God. Oftentimes we talk about this being the house of God. It is not the house of God. This is a building where we gather to worship. So house of God in Old Testament does not mean building in New Testament. But let's talk about what it means in the New Testament and for us as New Testament believers. I want you to look with me at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So then, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members, look, of the household of God. He's talking to Christians and said, you are members of the household of God. You say, okay, well, that's the household, Mike. That's just the family. That's not the house of God. But keep, keep looking here. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So the foundation, the apostles and the prophets, what is that referring to? That's the word of God. That's scripture that is written by the prophets and the apostles. So there is a a spiritual house of God with a foundation that is the Word of God where Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Verse 21 says, in whom the whole structure, so now it's not just family, it's structure. He's talking about building, being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So, in today's terminology, the house of God is the church, not the building. The church, this building is not the house of God, but all of the redeemed, all of those saved by Jesus, everyone who trusts Jesus in this room, together, collectively, we are the house of God. So while it's appropriate on the one hand to talk about how nowadays the the house of God is the individual, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says that each individual is the dwelling place of God. We are each the temple of God because when you become a Christian, when you entrust your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence within you. He dwells within you. So as individuals, we are the house of God but it's also appropriate to speak of the church as the house of God. When we come together, we make up the house of God. The Bible is our foundation. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And we, the people, are the building. So it's appropriate today to apply this passage to our corporate worship gatherings. That's what he's talking about. When you come to the house of God, he's talking about these times when you come collectively, corporately, to gather in the place where God dwells. This is what he's talking about. Do you expect to meet God when you show up here on Sunday morning? When you gather with other believers, do you expect to meet him? Now listen, this is something that John and I cannot do for you. We can't pray the presence of God into this place. We can't sing the presence of God into this place because God is here. He's here. You say, well, I I don't feel like he's here. doesn't matter what you feel like. 
He's here. We have to trust his truth and not our emotions. So if this is the place where we meet with God and if God dwells among his people, the question is how should we approach what we do here every week? Now we're getting into the heart of what this passage is about. Solomon gives us some great advice here. The first thing he says is watch your step. That's what he says in verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To guard your steps means more than just about where you put your feet. It's like when my dad used to say to me, watch your step. Now, when my dad said, watch your step, he, had no, it, he was not talking about where I walked, was he? What he's telling me is you need to think about what you're about to do next. You need to mull that over, and you make sure that what you're about to do is what you need to be doing. Watch your step. We're to watch our step when we come to this place. How much time did you spend in preparation before you came here today? How much time did you spend last night or this morning preparing your heart? Now, I know some of you are going, Mike, you don't know. Your kids are grown. You don't know what Sunday morning is like with a house full of kids. You're right. Even when my kids were little, I got up and left before dark, before the sun came up. And Terry had to deal with it. So I'll grant you that. But I'll also grant you that you need to set some time alone after the kids go to bed or before they get up in the morning. You say, are you telling me I need to lose some sleep? Yeah, watch your step. You're coming into the presence of God. Watch your step. This is serious. We need to prepare ourselves. Parents, what an opportunity you have to help prepare your kids, to help get them ready. This is not something we have to do on Sunday. This is, this is a high and holy privilege to come into this place with the company of the redeemed and sing praises to our God and hear his word. It's a wonderful thing. Now, I'm going to be a little bit confessional here. We just came, we spent, you guys know, before we came here, we spent some time on sabbatical and we were visiting churches when we were on sabbatical. And I'm just going to tell you that I have a critical spirit when it comes to church. And I think that comes from my background because I am, uh, I've been a preaching professor for years. I've taught preaching. I've taught worship leadership. I have done extensive research in the fields of preaching and worship and the history of worship. And I have a tendency when I go to church to evaluate rather than participate. I evaluate, why did they do that? I think they should have done it this way. I would have handled that differently. Why did the pastor put that illustration there? What's going on here? Why was the offering there? And so what I have to do, because I can tend to be critical, is I have to spend extra time getting ready. Terry will tell you, every Sunday, I would get up, I would get alone, me, my coffee, and my Bible, and I would start confessing my sinfulness to God. God, I need you to help me. If this is a terribly done worship service, help me worship you anyway. If they sing songs I don't like, God, help me not to be so selfish as to make it about my presence, but help me make it about you and not about my, I'm not there to worship my, God, help me get my heart right and focus, because that happens sometimes. Y'all ever had that happen? You go to church and you just don't like the songs and Man, how selfish is that of us to think like that, to think that church is about our preferences. And so I have to confess that, and I have to get my heart right, and it's really hard for me, y'all. And God, if the guy's not preaching a really good sermon, speak to me. Help me not evaluate him and help give me something positive where I can write him a letter or an email or say a word to him afterwards and give him some encouragement. And I have to prepare my heart because I don't want to walk into the house of God with a critical spirit. I want to watch my step. And it's hard. Any of y'all have struggles like that ever? Am I the only one? We need to prepare. How much thought, how much prayer, how much preparation went into your approach of this place today? Be careful. Be careful how you walk in this place. Be careful. Watch your step. Next thing he tells us is that receiving matters more than giving. You say, well, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say it's more blessed to give than to receive? Yes. What is the single most important factor in reading, understanding, and interpreting Scripture? Oh, my goodness. 
<laughs> Let's do that again. What's the single most important factor, reading, interpreting, understanding Scripture? Oh, you guys, you're going to get that down. It's context. It's con- context is delightful. Context is delicious. It's one of the best things. So we have to look at these two passages in context. In the New Testament, when Paul is talking about being more blessed to give than to receive, he's talking about giving money. It is more blessed to give with a glad and joyful heart to people in need than it is to be in need and receive. But that's not what's going on here. What he's talking about is what we receive when we come to church. He addresses the most important thing we do here. The last part of verse 1, he says, to guard your steps. And he says, to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifices of fools. I think there's a mentality I see a lot today that everything we do before the sermon is worship and then the sermon is the sermon. Everything we do here is worship. Everything we do here is built around the preaching of the Word of God. What's the centerpiece of this room? The pulpit where the Word of God is proclaimed. This is the holy desk, the sacred desk. Do you know the only perfect thing we do when we get together? There's only one perfect thing we do. That's reading the Bible. That's reading God's Word. Everything else, my interpretation of it, is, is open. I mean, it's my interpretation, right? And, and hopefully you're keeping me in check according to the one perfect thing, which is, which is the Bible. The sermon is central to worship. Hearing from God is more important than anything we say, anything we sing, anything we give. And right now, how you are listening to the preaching of God's Word is the measure of the quality and the sincerity of your worship. And the true test of your worship today is what you do when you leave here. If you want to come to me and say, man, that was a great sermon, that was a powerful sermon, that was a convicting sermon, I hope you mean it. And that what you're saying is, I'm going to leave here and I'm going to put that into action. It needs to affect what we do. Does what we do here, does this sermon matter to us? We're here to listen, to pay attention, and respond to God's Word. Some of you saw, I posted an interesting article on Facebook this week. Somebody actually did the math and looked at some of the the most most popular preachers in America today to see how long their sermons were. How many of y'all saw that? I think the shortest sermons by anybody was like 35 to 40 minutes. Most of them were in the 50 to 70 minute range. And somebody responded, two people actually responded, nobody's going to listen to a sermon for more than 20 minutes. And I've got two responses to that. Number one, I'm more hopeful about you than that. I think you're better than that. Not only that, I know you can sit through a two-hour movie. But here's the other thing I believe about that. I had a preaching professor say this, and I've said it to every one of my preaching classes since. It's not long sermons people don't want to sit through. It's bad ones. Isn't that right? So I know how good the sermon is by how well you're sitting through it. But here's the thing. If you're not hearing the sermon and if you're not doing it, your offering's not just okay. Your offering is what Solomon calls evil. It's better to listen than just to come not listening and throw some money in the plate. I'm just going to go write a check. I'm just going to go make a donation. I'm going to make a sacrifice. I don't need to hear the word of the Lord. He calls that evil. Well, those are pretty harsh words. You need to understand how serious God takes not just what we give, but how we give it. Do you remember the story in Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu? This is when everything started. When the tabernacle was new, and, and God was, was having Moses ordain the priesthood, and they were just starting. He gave very specific rules about how offerings were to be made. And Aaron came and offered, made an offering before the Lord, and we're told God accepted his offering. And then right after that, Nadab and Abihu said, well, we're going to do it our own way. And they offered what is called unauthorized fire. They did it not according to God's will. And you remember what happened to them? God torched them right there on the spot. He burned them to a crisp. You say, yeah, Mike, that's Old Testament. We don't see that stuff in New Testament until we get to Acts chapter 5 where we meet Ananias and Sapphira. The early part of the church, there were some people saying, hey, we're just going to sell our property and we're going to bring the proceeds. We got extra stuff. We're going to sell it. We're going to bring the proceeds to the church so that people can be fed, so that needs can be attended to. 
And Ananias and Sapphira, listen, nobody was commanded to do this. They didn't have to do it. It was not a mandate. But Ananias and Sapphira said, well, hey, let's sell some property, and we'll just give part of it and tell them we're giving it all. Remember what happened? Ananias walked in. Peter said, "Uh, did you give everything? He said, yeah, we gave everything. He said, no, you didn't, and you're going to die. Boom, he dropped dead. They carried him out. Sapphira walks in. Same thing. God kills her on the spot. You think God doesn't take seriously how we give? Our hearts are so important. Our offering is regarded by God based on what we do with his word. Next thing Solomon tells us is to think before we speak. Think before you speak. It's always a good idea, isn't it? Be slow to speak. Isn't that what we read in James chapter 1? Quick to listen, slow to speak. Confessional again, most of the trouble I've had in my life, my mouth has gotten me into. I am really, really good at that. I admire and kind of fear quiet people. I never know what they're thinking. But I admire people who know how to keep their mouths shut. And my, you know, I can't tell you how many times my mom said to me, why can't you keep your mouth shut? And I would usually respond with a smart aleck remark. And it didn't go well. I don't know why I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I just couldn't do it. I remember one time, my mom, I was doing something. My mom, this is one of those things, y'all will relate to this. Mom wants, wants me to do one thing. Dad wants me to do another thing. <clears throat> I'm doing what dad's doing. Mom walks in the room. I'm caught in the middle of that. She goes, what are you doing? I said, playing golf. What does it look like I'm doing? Mm, yeah. My mom was 5'3", my dad was 6'4", and everyone was afraid of mom. (laughs) So it's always to to be careful what you say, right? But this is actually in the context, again, context, it's in the context of corporate worship, verses 2 and 3. So how do we apply this? Look at this. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. God's in heaven. And you're on earth, therefore let your words be few. Dreams have a lot of busyness. Dreams are all wordy and active. And a fool's voice, fools talk with lots of words. So how do we apply this to corporate worship? Well, let me tell you, there are some things. He's talking about the rash and and, and different kinds of words. Let me give you four kinds of words to avoid when we worship. Number one, wrong words. We need to be careful what we sing. Now, Granted, this falls mainly on me and John about the lyrics that we sing, but we need to be careful not to sing. There's some songs out there that are just ridiculous. They do not, maybe they're not heresy, maybe they're not non biblical, they're just sub biblical, if you know what I mean. They're just, they're not good words. We need to be careful what we sing and what we say. Don't use wrong words. Secondly, avoid empty words. What I mean is when you say the words, you need to engage your mind and your heart when you say them. When we sing, are you engaging? Or is it just empty? There, in the ground, his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then, bursting forth, and glorious day, up from the grave, he rose again. If you are engaged in that, if you are engaged in those words, and you are born again to a living hope by the resurrected Christ, you can't go, up from the grave, he rose again. You are engaged. Don't be empty with your words. Sing it like you mean it. This is real. This is serious. God takes it seriously. Watch your step and watch your word. Watch out with arrogant words, questioning God, accusing God. Well, I'm mad at God. He did this. I don't like that guy. I don't know what God's up to. And in Romans chapter 9, Paul is talking about some really complex theology, and he anticipates the objection. Some of you are going to say, well, why does God do that? Is God just? And what's his answer? Does he explain it? No. He says, who are you to talk back to God? When Job asked God, what are you doing here, God? What did God say to him? I'll ask the questions here. You brace yourself. And after God responds, you remember what Job said in chapter 40 of Job? He said, I will put my hand over my mouth. And God said, you do that, but I'm not done. 
Be careful about being arrogant before God. Watch out with rash words. Don't say words you don't mean. How many times have we sung, all to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus. I surrender. I surrender all. When we haven't surrendered anything, don't be rash with your words before God. Think before you speak. And that goes into the next one. Don't make promises you won't keep. That's what he says in verse 4. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it. Verse 5, it's better you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. Verse 6, let your mouth not lead you into sin and don't say before the messenger, oh, it was just a mistake. Clearly, he's talking about somebody vowing to pay God. Not pay God, but to make, a, to make an offering to the house of God. And that would go with us. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to the building fund or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And you make a commitment and don't follow through on it. Sometimes these happen, in with, happen with bargaining with God. God, if you'll just, if I can get this job, I'll tithe every week. Six months later, you tithing every week? Well, no, I got a job now. Or getting caught up in the emotional. You get caught up in the emotion. Got to be careful about that. Or, or you get prideful. We need to watch our prideful hearts thinking that we are, are, are something in ourselves. And we mean this, I think, with sincerity. But here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about recommitments. I know people who've recommitted their lives to the Lord 15, 20 times. Why does it take that many times? You know why? Because you're saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be better. I'm going to stop living like that. You need to take the eye out of it and say, oh, God, help. If you make a commitment, you need to follow through because excuses won't work. And then finally, he says to fear God. In verse 7, when dreams increase, words grow many, there's vanity, but God, God is the one you must fear. Does this mean we're supposed to be afraid of God? At times. Hear me. If you're not a Christian, you are not in right standing with God, and you should be afraid of God because you're going to stand before him in judgment, and your only hope for salvation is Jesus Christ. And you need to get right with him today, and we're going to give you opportunity to do that today. You need to leave here right with Jesus. You need to fear God enough to know that you have offended him and that you stand as condemned before him until you embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior. But here, He's talking about this reverent awe that we need to have toward God. One of my, I guess my favorite Old Testament scholars, a man named Dan Block, he was, he was a professor of mine at Southern Seminary. He wrote a neat book on the theology of worship called For the Glory of God. Listen to what he says. He says, evangelical worship today often lacks gravitas appropriate to the occasion and the divine auditor who invites us to an audience with him. True worship, he says, need not be humorless, but neither will it be casual or flippant. Is celebration appropriate in worship? Yeah. Is shouting appropriate? Yeah. Is lifting your hands? Is dancing? Yeah. Those things are appropriate in worship, but I'm afraid we have lost the ability to quiet ourselves before God, to be silent, to meditate on His holiness and His goodness and confess our sins before Him. I think in a lot of ways we've lost the idea of reverence today. By the way, reverence isn't something we can create from up here. Reverence is something that takes place in the heart. I did some research a while back, an assignment for a class. I chose to do research on the history of church architecture. Fascinating. Fascinating the theology that goes into church architecture. For example, before the Protestant Reformation, do you know where the pulpit was located? It was on the side. 
And after the Protestant Reformation, it was moved to the middle. Why? To show that the Word of God is central to what we do. There's theology in our architecture. But here's, here's one of the big changes in church architecture. For hundreds of years, you ever been into old historical churches? They're tall, right? They're tall. They have things to look at up high. They're designed. What is their purpose? They're designed. When you walk in, their design is to make you do this. Their design is to draw your eyes heavenward. Have you ever been to some of those old historical churches and seen their pulpits? They're way up here. You've got to climb steps to get to the pulpit. Let me tell you, there was a theology and a philosophy behind this, and it was this. The Word of God sits in judgment over the people of God. And when you attend to worship, you come to hear the man of God proclaim the Word of God to know what you must do. But something started happening, and it really gained momentum in the 80s with the seeker-sensitive movement. We went from people and word to word and people. We designed theater-style buildings where the lowest point in the room is the pulpit. Now, instead of sitting under the judgment of the Word of God, we sit in judgment of the Word of God. Instead of coming to say, I need to hear what my marching orders from the Lord all this w- are this week, we come and say, I'll see if I like what the preacher has to say or not. Everything is backwards. I like that we have a high platform, by the way. I think it says something doctrinally, theologically. We have to have a balcony so everybody can see. I'm not, I'm not capping on you balcony people up there. I'm really not. <laughs> So often it seems, though, like we come to church to be entertained. I want you to think about the words you use after church on Sunday afternoon or on Monday when you go to work. I enjoyed church yesterday, or I didn't enjoy church. Do you know, enjoy isn't even a word we ought to use. That's what you use. I enjoyed Dunkirk. I saw the movie. I enjoyed it. I liked the songs we sang. I didn't like the songs we sang. Who cares if I like the songs we sang or didn't like them? I liked the sermon. I didn't like the sermon. Church was good. Church was bad. Church was boring. Those are entertainment terms. Those put me in the place of God. And I'm afraid we're going to incur the judgment of God. And I'm going to tell you, all these prosperity preachers out there, I agree with Paul Washer that there are so many prosperity preachers out there preaching this nonsense drivel because that is the judgment of God on people who say, just entertain me. Tell me what I want to hear. And God says, fine, I will. Here you go. We who are in worship leadership often feel like we are expected to be entertainers, to make as many people as happy as possible. And somebody comes and says, a lot of us aren't happy, so we're supposed to fix it to make you happy. So you can come and be entertained and enjoy and like and be happy. No, that is not the worship of God. Watch your step. We are not in the entertainment business. We we have an audience here today. His name is God Almighty, Lord of hosts, King of the universe. It is not me. It is not you. It is Him. He's the audience. We need to be concerned with, did He like the song? Did He like the sermon? Was He pleased with what we did? Was He satisfied with my offering? He's the only one that matters. And I, like you, forget that week to week to week. 
I get caught up in it. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm saying we're all in this, aren't we? Surely I'm not the only one who struggles with selfishness and flippancy and a casual attitude. I hope I'm not the only one in the room. Actually, I hope I am. So here's our takeaway today. Give to God acceptable worship. How do we do that? Thanks for asking. The New Testament tells us. Now, before we put this passage on the screen, if you ever read the book of Romans, 11 chapters is a detailed exposition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 11 chapters of theology. And in chapter 12, he starts talking about how to apply the theology. Look at the very first thing he says, Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. How do you give acceptable worship to God? You give yourself to Jesus Being a Christian is not a small thing. Being a Christian is not just about walking an aisle, praying a prayer, getting dunked. Being a Christian is about being saved by grace through faith. But faith means that you are trusting God, mind, body, and soul. Every single fiber in your being is in Him now. All of you. And if you are not a Christian and you want to just go through the motions and hope you're going to be okay with God someday, you're actually making a mockery of Him. But if you are a Christian, isn't it good to know that as you and I both sin when we come to the house of God, isn't it good to know that our sins have been atoned for? Because that's what Jesus did on the cross. All of the sins we have committed, all of the wrath, anger, and condemnation we have stored up for God, God unleashed completely on Christ our substitute. He took all that I deserve and he poured it out on Jesus. But that's not the only thing that happened. Not only did our sins get atoned for, but there was what we call a double imputation. I saw yesterday there's a t-shirt that says double imputation. I love it. Y'all know what that is, right? 2 Corinthians 5.21. He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus never sinned, and he took all the consequences of sin. That's called the the imputation of our sins to Jesus, and then his righteousness was imputed to us. This means, here's, here's what all that means. If you're in Christ, as you stand before God today, and when you stand before God as he sits on the great white throne of judgment, he is going to judge you on the righteousness of Jesus and not your own. That's the best news I've ever heard. That's the best news the planet has ever heard. Because if I'm judged on my own righteousness, I'm going to hell. My worship, here's, here's the deal, you guys. All of this to say, my worship, since I'm in Christ, is based on the perfect worship of Jesus. It's judged on the perfect worship of Jesus. So some of you would say, well then, it really doesn't matter what I do. That is the sentiment of an unconverted person. Because if you have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus, if you have right standing with God because of what Jesus has done for you, you don't look for loopholes and make excuses and say, oh, well then I don't have to do anything. You are striving to do all that God would have you to do. What are you doing here? Does it matter? Does does Sunday morning matter? Does it affect Sunday afternoon and Monday morning and Thursday evening and Saturday I wonder if, like me, you you who are Christians would join me in how I've been praying this week. 
I've said, God, you deserve better. Make me a better worshiper. Help me stop worrying about entertainment on my likes, my dislikes, on what I want to do. Help me watch my step and watch my words and not be rash and quick to make vows. In fact, I'm asking you not just to say, okay, I'm never going to worship wrong again. That's a vow you're not going to keep. But would you... Would you join me in saying, God, I really want to do this better so that it means something that lasts longer than today. I can do better. Is there some way you could too? Let's spend a minute just going before the Lord. Let's be quiet before the Lord. You know what? We don't always need music playing, do we? Let's get quiet. Let's quiet our hearts. Let's examine our hearts. Let's ask God where we have failed in this area and ask for his help and his mercy and getting it right. Let's pray. Just be quiet before him for a minute.